Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Moss Ingram. I'm going to be uh, working with you in a, uh, really this is going to be like a workshop. Um, DNA test your writing. And um, I've been uh, teaching at the college since 2004. I started a, uh, a computer support technician program in our job training department. Uh, but prior to that, I've been working in the, uh, the world of writing for uh, a number of years. I've worked as a journalist. Um, currently, right now, I also uh, contract as a copywriter. Um, I'm also uh, going through a, uh, an MFA program for creative writing. And uh, so I'd like, you know, as we, as we go through this, I want to share some of these um, experiences with you as well. The first thing I'd like to ask you is um, if you receive an email uh, from your best friend or a close family member uh, or a Facebook post or a text message or a tweet or even a birthday card, would you be able to recognize that it came from that person if you didn't have a signature or any kind of identifying information? Would you know that it was them? Yeah, and, and of course, you know, for perhaps if, you know, there's uh, folks in here who don't text, right? Text messages are really brief. They're super short. So how is it? What are, what are some of the things that you can identify in such a short, short message that instantly tells you this is my girlfriend versus somebody else? Yeah. And how about tone, right? Um, have you ever gotten an email message from uh, somebody close to you who you, you, know, you email with often? And this message is like, whoa, you know, what's going on here? Like, what's this all about? And then you look up at the top and you're like, oh, this isn't just to me. This is to, like, this is a, to, a, you know, to several people. Or, uh, you know, you're, you're, it, maybe you're not even addressed in the message. Maybe you're copied on the message, and yet you took the message personally. So these are ways in which uh, writing can instantly communicate things to us that may not be inherent in the communication. They may not be uh, purposefully directed in a way that um, uh, the communication is, is sort of in an expository way. It's sort of an underlying undercurrent in which we can understand uh, different communications. So I'll play this video, which actually I loaded over here. Well, the basic question is, who wrote all of these documents, uh, letters to the editor, editorials, unsigned political pieces from the mid-19th century? Some of them may have been by Abraham Lincoln, some of them probably weren't, and historians have been arguing about this for a century. Uh, we have been developing a piece of technology that we think can help shed light on this, and we're delighted to be working with the Papers of Abraham Lincoln Project out of Springfield, Illinois, and the National Endowment for the humanities in order to apply our technology to developing a real solution to this problem. These are genuine documents that historians don't know who wrote. Now we can tell who wrote them, and we'll learn a lot about Lincoln by doing so with them. Well, basically what we have here and what we've been working on for five years is a program to tell who wrote a particular document by analyzing the words and phrases and concepts that the person uses. Uh, and for example, are you the sort of person that says can't or that says cannot? Or are you the sort of person who writes cannot with a space or without? Now, the trick is that by focusing on these little words, 
they're barely heard by the brain, they're barely processed, and you don't pay attention to it when you hear it, you don't pay attention to it when you say it. So it's very difficult for you to control and to not use words that are characteristically yours. So you have your set of characteristic words, I have my set of characteristic words, but because we're two different people, with two different backgrounds, I can tell the difference between the two of us by looking at these characteristic little words. And the program gets well into the 90% accuracy. So you know, here's a remarkable project where um, Abraham Lincoln, who you know has not been with us for a long, long time, because we have a vast amount of his writing that we know is from him, and there's, there's this questionable writing. It's like, did he write this or not? Because we have this repository, because we have this database of his writing style, the way he wrote in different you know time periods of his life, that can help us verify uh, whether or not he wrote some of the other things that we have in question. Um, who's aware of uh, what's happened here? It's, it's right now being called the greatest hoax in the decade. Is anybody familiar with Robert Galbraith? If I'm saying that right, yeah, Galbraith? Uh, you know, he supposedly recently wrote a book um, uh, called The Cuckoo's Calling, and then some information started to uh, get leaked on Twitter about how J.K. Rowling, you know, billionaire author of uh, the Harry Potter series, shares the same publisher, editor, I guess, and agent as Robert Galbraith. And this... Uh, has turned out that they're actually one and the same uh, people. She took on the pseudonym of Robert Galbraith in order to uh, avoid the connection of her popular name and, of course, the, the uh, young adult series that she wrote. So foreign linguistics uh, out of J.K. Rowling, well, the, the uh, computer scientist we saw in the video a moment ago was the very individual who, as this uh, story started to break, uh, they asked him, would you take this book, The Cuckoo's Calling, and would you take J.K. Rowling's work in the Harry Potter series and analyze this and figure out, would you tell us, is this the same person or not? And he came back and said, oh yeah, that's absolutely the same person. Uh, it was definitely written by the same, the same person. And so the, the uh, paragraph here that I think applies the best to what we're talking about is that with computers and sophisticated statistical analysis, researchers are mining all sorts of famous texts for clues about their authors. Perhaps more surprisingly, they're also mining not so famous texts like blogs, tweets, Facebook updates, and even Amazon reviews for clues about people's lifestyles and buying habits. The whole idea is so amusingly ironic, isn't it? Writers choose words deliberately to convey specific messages, but those same words, it turns out, carry personal information that we don't realize we're giving out. Quote, there's a kind of fascination with the thought that a computer sleuth can discover things that are hidden there in the text, things about the style of the writing that the reader can't detect and the author can't do anything about. A, a kind of signature or DNA or fingerprint of the way they write, uh, so says uh, Peter Milliken of Oxford University. So uh, I find this absolutely fascinating that um, you know when we sit down to write, whether it's a, a text or an email or a paper, um, I think we tend to think that we're you know we're pretty well in control of our own communication, and yet even someone who is as skilled and uh, has been writing for his number, of, you know, the, the, the vast number of words and the years that J.K. Rowling has been writing, that she cannot hide, she cannot truly hide uh, who she is as an individual, uh, I think is, is really, really fascinating. So the concept is that all of our writing and everything we've written, everything that we will write, reflects our uniqueness as individuals. And when we write a college level of composition essay, even if we follow the strict rules of 
how do we, you know, how are we supposed to write a, a college level composition? Um, our uniqueness is still present. Our uniqueness still sort of leaks through on the page. So the argument that I want to uh, present is that our writing is just as unique as a, of an identifier as our DNA. And that the checks and balances that are found in DNA, as we'll look at that uh, shortly, uh, are just as present as they are in, in good composition. I am curious to hear what you think about this. You may want to think twice the next time you spit out your gum or drop a cigarette butt in a public. New York artist Heather Dewey Hagborg might pick it up, extract the DNA, and turn it into a 3D face that could look like you. A lot of my work begins with a question. In this particular case, the question was, what can I learn about someone from a single hair? Once she finds a sample, she takes it to the lab to mine it for DNA and analyze the results. From a cigarette butt, I can learn where some of the ancestors likely came from, their gender, eye color, hair color, complexion. The information is fed into a computer program that generates a 3D model of a face. The way that I'm using code here is a lot like how a sketch artist would use a pencil. It takes about eight hours to print in 3D at NYU's Advanced Media Studio. Then the excess powder is removed to reveal the disembodied face from a stranger's DNA. But there are limitations, like the length of a person's nose or shape of their face cannot be determined. The faces have a general likeness that might look like a family resemblance. Right now, I can't determine age, so all of my masks are aged between 20 and 40. Dewey Hagborn started the project called Stranger Visions after creating her self-portrait two years ago. Now she's hoping it will raise questions about genetic privacy. It's meant to be an exploration at the intersection of art and technology and science, and it's meant to be a provocation. What are your reactions to that? Weird? Yeah. What else? Creepy? Please. Yeah, I don't, um, you know, they say that, that it's going to have a, a, a fair resemblance uh, to what the, what the person actually looks like. And the, the mask that I was most uh, interested in that shows in the video is of the artist herself, which I think, you know, looks quite a bit like her. Um, and so, you know, here she is picking up these things that, you know, many of us might leave all over the place, not necessarily as uh, cigarette butts or something, but in, in other ways. And, um, and that you can just tell a ton of information from such a small, small piece of uh, DNA. So uh, let's put our technical writer hats on for a moment and let's um, sort of in just really broad brushstrokes, what is she doing? Like, what are the steps that she's taking to accomplish this? Lost, uh, lost video, it just turned off. Hmm. What are the steps that she's taking? So she finds, uh, she's got she's, she's to collect something, right? So you've got to collect things that she supposes has DNA. Good. She needs to choose the location where she's collecting things. Good, right? So she's got to, she's got to pick a location where it's going to be sort of rich in DNA, right? There's got to be lots of samples. What else? Enter the information. What's that? She has to enter all the information. Yeah, right? But, you know, I, the other thing that I think she has to do before that is she has to separate sort of the noise, right? There's going to be other... There's going to be other things that are going to show up, I think, in her analysis that she has to separate. And then she's got to put all that stuff into the... That's right. That's right. Good. Good, good, good. So um, what I'd like to do is, um, if you would, if you could come up and grab a packet, 
just probably one per table, but if you have three people at a table, I want you to grab two of these packets. These are our DNA samples we're going to be working with. I'll put um, a box of them there. I think we'll have plenty. Make sure that your uh, envelope has a lump in it. Make sure your envelope has a lump in it. Thanks, Noah. So these are essentially uh, the steps that she's taking in order to accomplish this work. And these are the very same steps that I want us to take uh, going through this. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, thankfully not work with uh, cigarette butts or gum or hair or any of that stuff. We're going to work with something better. We're going to work with paragraphs, OK? And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, sort of collect and organize these paragraphs from the environment that's within this envelope. And what I'd like you to do is I want you to partner with uh, whoever it is you're sitting with and remove uh, the largest sheet of paper that's in the front of the envelope as you open it. So this sheet of paper is going to have three paragraphs on it. It's going to have three paragraphs on it. And the top paragraph uh, says, after both Bobby and Daryl graduated from the CST program. OK. And I'd like you to take a moment and just read these paragraphs. You don't have to read them terribly closely, but uh, just take a moment and just read these paragraphs. What do you notice? What are some of the, what are some of the things you notice uh, about these paragraphs? <coughs> yeah, the tone and the text is different in each one. So, um, do you suppose they were written by the same person or different people? Yeah. Right, absolutely different people, because of that tone and that text. Um, how about? Uh, the familiarity, right? It's like the, you know, the first paragraph to me seems like it's very familiar, it's much more casual. Second paragraph is, you know, pretty academic, very, very formal. And then the last one is uh, very instructive, right? It's like do this, very uh, um, laying down, this is, you know, quite, it's like step four, uh, do this. So, We know um, they're definitely not from the same source, and we can determine that uh, in the ways that we've already talked about. And what I hope you get just from this simple exercise, because you know, um, I think it's rare that you ever get a chance. I mean, if you think about this, I don't know uh, when the last time uh, any of us ever looked at a sheet of paper that had 
let's say, three paragraphs on it that were written by three different people, and there was no other distractions. I mean, it's one thing to look at the newspaper and see different articles written by different people and advertising and so on. But to look at a sheet of paper with three very different paragraphs from three different sources uh, just speaks volumes. I think all of a sudden these paragraphs become loud as far as uh, the information that's in them. So how does uh, a DNA uh, helix uh, relate to what we recognize as a paper uh, there on the right? When scientists, and I'm not uh, an organic chemist, but when scientists are looking to validate uh, DNA, this is one of the very first things that they look for, is they look for these three bases to validate the information that's within them, okay? And when you compare this to what I'm gonna call the three bases of writing a paper, you have an introduction, you have a body, and you have a conclusion. And there are these rules that in order to write a good uh, college level composition, these are the rules that you follow. And of course, this is for specific rules for a, a five paragraph uh, paper. So when you compare these, what are some similarities that you see between a DNA uh, base structure and the, and the papers? What is it? Yeah, it's a procedure. There are rules. It's a, it's a strict structure. And if you, and I don't know how well you can see this from where you're sitting, but when you look at these letters and you look at these um, compounds, they are repeated. There's, there's, a, there's a number of rep repetitions that occur in this structure, which is the same thing that should happen in your papers. That's the same thing that should happen in your papers. So now what I'd like you to do is, uh, with, your, with your partner, I'd like you to pick one of these paragraphs, preferably either the first one or the last one on this page, and I want you to tear it apart. I want you to, I want you to fold it over and rip it away from the rest of the paper, okay? But you can only pick one. You and your partner have to pick uh, one, preferably the first or the third. Which one did you pick? The first one? First one? First one? The last one? Okay. First one? Last one? First? 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 Why? Was it? Too much work to cut it? Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Why the first one over the, over the third one? Is what? Has a meaning. Yeah, it's much. I think it's much more inviting. How come you guys picked the third one? Okay. All right. Because you know maybe you just went through that process, right? Yeah. Good. So, um, you know, the question of why did you pick that particular paragraph? Uh, and and what I hope you get out of that is right away just by by asking you to choose a paragraph. The, you know, the reaction that I'm, I'm hearing from you guys is that you have an affinity, right? There's an affinity, there's, there's some sort of um, immediate uh, attraction or um, not being interested in looking at one or the other paragraphs, right? I 
I feel like we've uh, talked about that a little bit already. So if you, um, you know, are looking at these paragraphs, you know, we've already talked about how uh, the second one is very formal, the first one is very familiar, the third one uh, being very uh, uh, directive. But every paragraph, in order for a paragraph to hold meaning, um, there has to be some sort of valuable information in it. Every one of your paragraphs that you write should contain some kind of unique, valuable information that, by and large, is not found in any other paragraphs in your paper. So some interesting facts about DNA. Uh, it turns out that the difference uh, between all of us from one another is less than 1% when it comes to DNA. So as they are analyzing, as somebody picks up some DNA, the amount of uh, data that makes any one of us different from everybody else is less than 1%, less than 1%. And if somebody were to type uh, the words um, associated with the human genome, it would take eight hours a day, around 50 years, at 60 words per minute to type all of the information that's in the human genome. And if you took all the letters in the human genome and you stacked them one millimeter apart, uh, they would reach a height uh, of 7,000 times higher than the Empire State Building. So that's a ton of information. And my argument is that if 99% uh, of well-written essays follow the same common structure and we're all using the same words from the uh, English dictionary, then how much of your essay can be truly unique? And wouldn't the same sort of rules apply there? So assuming that less than 1% of your paper is truly unique, and we're just uh, less than 1% you know, unique from each other as far as DNA, um, how might this relate to a professor's ability to detect plagiarism? Right, it makes it really, really easy because you can, as soon as you identify uh, some things that are sort of out of character, now your uh, teacher or your professor is gonna say, oh my gosh, you know, uh, what is this? Um, and then start taking a, a deeper look. So the last exercise, whoops, last exercise is what I'd like you to do is um, open up your packet and pull out all of these uh, strips of paper. And over the next few minutes, I'd like to see who can recreate as many essays as you can. In this pile, there are magazine articles and there are uh, academic essays. And I'd like to see how many of these you can recreate in the next few minutes. As you start to piece them together, uh, you'll see that you have a, a roll of tape. You know, feel free to start taping them together. As you start to look at them, I think you're gonna start to see lots and lots of immediate clues about which ones go with which.
I can tell you that the, um, the story or the article that has the most paragraphs is 10. The longest one has 10 paragraphs. Uh, the shortest ones have three. So there are some pieces in this that only have three paragraphs associated with them. Who thinks they have one so far? Anybody? One? One? Oh, gar all right. Who has two? Not quite. OK. And at this point, I'm, I'm more interested in you grouping them rather than putting them in an order. I, I'm, uh, I'm more interested in you just being able to, you know, take all these samples that, you know, under the analogy of uh, the artist finding DNA specimens sort of out in the wild, being able to identify what belongs with what.
You guys are doing great. Yeah, that's a good one to pick. <laughs> that's a, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, it should be in there, but. Hmm. It could happen, yeah, or maybe it's in the, it's maybe got tucked in with some of the other papers in there, I don't know. Were you guys missing number four? Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, gosh. Hey, at least I know I'm not the only one. Somebody said, we're going to play a game. Oh, was it on? That's it. Yeah. Um, so this was a part of those original, uh, those original paragraphs, uh, right? There you go. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Wow. Good job. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, good, good, good. Give you just a couple more minutes. So how was this exercise? Yeah. Don't want to be an editor, okay? Okay. Other reactions. What did you think about this? What did you did, did you know did you did you learn anything? Did you find yourself putting together one paragraph, you know, a certain Paper more than another. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, which which one? Uh, the five steps. Yeah, the five steps, right? Because of it, just okay, right? There they are. That that made it easy. How about some of the other ones? What were some of the clues that you picked up on that said, okay, I think these two things? Yeah, right. You should see, you know, that same yeah names, right? 
Bobby Shields, Othello, and so on. My question uh, to you is how easily, if you were to do this with your own composition papers, how easily could you do this with your own paper? Okay, how come? I jump around too much. You jump around too much, all right. So could this exercise be helpful? Yeah, help organize. Um, this is something I would encourage you to do. This is something I do uh, as, a, as a writing consultant for uh, people who are putting together books or they're submitting a paper, uh, helping uh, other faculty with uh, their graduate work or uh, doctoral work, is to break these things down. And you can do this also to the sentence level as well, but you know, to, to not go too granular, you know, to break these things down to the paragraph and say, what does this paragraph say? And are you saying it in the order that you want to say it is really, really important in order to effectively communicate to your readers. So then the other question is, um, if your professors were to do this with your papers, would they be able to reassemble? Would they be able to take, let's say, your body of work over a semester, <laughs> You know, could they take, you know, could, could they take your body of work over a semester, do the same exercise, would they be able to separate your paragraphs from one paper to another paper? They must be able to do this. They must be able to do this. You must be able to do this with your work. If you're able to do this with your work, your writing will be so much stronger. Your writing will be so clear for paragraphs to stand on their own and to complement one another to drive the reader, to encourage the reader to continue reading uh, through your work should be a, a huge goal. So assessing your work at the paragraph level, uh, you know, I think will uh, dramatically improve uh, your writing. Other reflections to that, other reactions to that. Okay. So the next time you write a composition or an essay, um, what I'm asking you to consider is uh, do this very exercise. Take each paragraph and slice it up. And I think a, a really great uh, thing to do would be to go to our tutors with these strips of paper and ask them, as you sit down and work with your tutor, can they reassemble your paper? I think you're gonna, you're gonna have a very interesting conversation about where things should go, where things should be reordered, uh, I, do, I, I continue to do this with my work, even though I've been doing this for years and years and years. I am constantly reordering things. As I'm writing a paper, uh, and, it's, and it's hard not to edit when you're writing. Those are two separate processes that should happen at two separate times, really. But even in this presentation, the amount of slides that I moved things around, the amount of reorganization of the ideas and the communication, um, the, the more time you spend, the more thoughtful time you spend at it, uh, you're going to end up with a much stronger uh, communication. So are your paragraphs placed in the best or correct order? Are they written clearly? Can they stand on their own? Is the voice, language, or tone throughout the paragraphs consistent? Uh, do they fit together? Um, I find that if I'm working on a piece uh, one day, and especially if a few days go by and I sit back down, I may write uh, on the topic, but my voice has completely changed, right? It's not as formal as it should be, or it's not as um, casual as it should be, depending on the piece. So these are things that we have to pay attention to, because when your reader is reading these things, that can be very, very jarring. They're like, oh my gosh, this is a very formal piece or a very informal piece. And then why was there this uh, huge shift? We should uh, make sure that these things fit together. And of course, ensure that the reader is going to be compelled to continue reading, that they're going to find new value in each paragraph uh, as, they, as they move through your piece. So this is a project that I'm currently working on. Um, I didn't take, uh, I took this picture strategically because I didn't want to show how messy my desk is. But these are um, a couple of monitors uh, that I use, they're, they're rather large because I find that uh, having lots and lots of space to look at lots and lots of pages at the same time, again, moving things around at a paragraph level is really helpful. So I'm, uh, I'm uh, 
working as a, um, a copywriter for a tech company uh, that's based out of uh, New York and Singapore. And what I have taped uh, to my ceiling is a series of uh, pages that talk about, they're, they're, they're considered branding documents that have the voice, the syntax, essentially what does this company want to con convey about themselves and about their product. And then as I'm working on um, helping them really about their website and, and, and marketing is to ensure that every single paragraph, every single page that shows up on their website complements their brand to make sure that there's agreement throughout. And so as I'm uh, reworking things, uh, writing new copy for them, I find myself continually looking up at these pages to remind myself this is the language that they want to see. This is the tone that they want to have. Uh, this is the feeling that they want to convey when someone visits their site. This is another project, so you can see my kids stuff, uh, you know, the, the play area and, and uh, my work area are quite often the same space. But this is, um, this is the graduate work that I'm working on right now. So this is, this is my thesis. There are over 70 uh, index cards. Uh, that, the, the level of distance between, you know, from one corner to the other, um, I think is about like 17 feet, 18 feet. And those cards get thrown away. They get constantly moved around, um, reshuffled and organized and rewritten. Uh, and of course, you know, more cards uh, show up. But this is the level of organization that I'm attempting uh, to communicate through my, through my thesis. And um, so I want to show this as an example of these are, you know, these are some other things you can do as you're working with uh, uh, you know, putting together a paper to work at an index card level, I think can be, for me, it's, it's less intimidating than staring at a blank page. You know, just, it's like, oh my gosh, it's pretty easy to write down, you know, four or five words on an index card and figure out where am I going to place this as opposed to, okay, I have to write this paper uh, as though it's all one thing, sort of all at once. This is, um, I was hired by the uh, authors of this book uh, a few years ago, and they originally hired me as a, um, a copy editor, uh, a book editor for them, and they wanted um, they, they needed some help as far as uh, getting this book published. They had, uh, none of these uh, now authors had, had ever been published uh, before. And in working with them, uh, it became clear to me that they had a, they had a different need. Uh, their need was not so much from the standpoint of that they had trouble uh, writing, that they really needed an editor. I mean, everybody needs an editor. Um, but what their, their struggle with writing this book, uh, which they, they didn't know that they had, but in, as I was reading it, the difficulty as a reader was they kept uh, leading the reader along for some sort of big reveal, right? Who wants to read a book? where you go 200, 300 pages into it before you actually get to some kind of an answer or some kind of a solution. So um, what I did was I worked with them to say, uh, right down to the paragraph and to the page level, here's a paragraph that has no value. There's no information in here. Here's another page where you're, you're leading the reader on, but you're not giving them anything. You have to give your reader information regularly there's got to be at least you know, two or three points per page in a, in a work like this in order to keep uh, the, reader, the reader reading. So they, they completely reorganized the book and, and it was published with uh, their most desirable publisher. So even though I've always loved writing, um, it's also uh, always been a struggle. And when I first uh, started uh, writing, you know, for, for college, when I was uh, a student in college, and still am, uh, is um, that I didn't understand the rules. I didn't realize that there was this, you know, very strict uh, framework, and if I just knew what those buckets were and poured the words into those buckets and, and arranged them in a way that conveyed the information, uh, the writing and, and, quite frankly, my grades would improve uh, dramatically. So I would encourage you not to look at 
papers as a whole, at least in the beginning, look at them at the paragraph level, and I think you'll find uh, sort of a whole new world open up um, when you do that. And I hope that this, I hope this workshop has been uh, helpful to you. Um, are there any questions for me about what we did or comments about what we did? I'd love for you to take these kits. Um, they're really designed, f you know, if you take a look at the papers that are in the, in the beginning, uh, there's a essay writing for basics. There's um, a couple of other essays in here. And if you look at the back of each one of these, they're designed to be cut up. So, you know, at a later date, I would love for you to cut these up and see if you can't reorder these, perhaps even after you've read them as a whole, as a whole essay, uh, as an exercise. Pat, you had a question. Thank you, thank you. And I, I really like the way you're stressing the structure of it and also um, the, the simplicity of looking at the paragraph first and then, you know, to avoid the, the overall frustration and confusion of what's going on the Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think, I think you know, when, you, when, we, um, when we work at the whole paper level, especially if we're not comfortable with uh, you know, a, a multi-page paper, it can be really overwhelming. And this is so important in the editing process as well as the organization. Yeah. Outlining that too. So I think it can be very Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Survive the weather. Thank you.